morning uh, schedules. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, by Tom McElroy, I mean, on the top of the He's going to uh, talk about measuring ozone and handling straight line spectrometer. This straight line issue has been the most serious issue in the uh, GEMS uh, measurements. Okay. Uh, to make uh, time multiplex measurements 
or we can actually use a single slit and scan the grading uh, in order to collect an entire uh, UV spectrum. And the question of collecting straight light is a more uh, pressing issue in trying to understand the whole UV spectrum. So the issues that we have to face in any kind of spectrometer uh, involve this pretty complicated list of stuff. Uh, we have to understand the slip function very well because you have to be able to uh, convolve uh, your theoretical spectrum with the slip function of the instrument in order to be able to accurately match the uh, uh, behavior of the instrument. If the resolution is extremely high, the slip function isn't so important, but if the resolution is on the order or close to uh, on the order of the uh, structure in the absorption spectrum you're looking for, then the precise value of the cross sections will depend on the width of the slip function. If you think about the NO2 spectrum that has a, a very structured spectrum, if you have a slip function that's on the order of that structure, then the absorption function will uh, appear to be half as sensitive than it would be otherwise. So you have to get the slip function really right or you'll get the amplitude of the absorption model. We have to understand the sensitivity, the stability of the sensitivity. Uh, in the case of something like the uh, reticon and perhaps some other array detectors, you can have analyzing uh, the uh, uh, surface of the uh, detector, and uh, the analyzing could change the temperature. Uh, you could have to make corrections for that by building it into your retrieval. And it's a question of pixel to pixel gain, both for the sensitivity of the detector to light, and also for the, uh, uh, the dark count uh, level from each pixel. If you're trying to get down to the absolute best performance you can get from the detector. Dynamic range is a big issue because every detector has a finite well depth. It can store only so many electrons, and uh, so it can be quite difficult to achieve a dynamic range, and you may need to have fairly complicated strategies to handle the different uh, range of intensity you're going to do. And of course, you have to understand uh, how to correct dark count in the detector and how to handle the noise level, because uh, when you're doing fitting, you need to account for the fact that each measurement isn't exactly precise. You have to have a, a weighting in your uh, uh, cost function for doing fitting that reflects the accuracy with which you think you can make a measurement. And the thing I'm going to talk about mostly, of course, is straight light and maybe a little bit of linearity. Of course, in designing the instrument, you have to deal with the issue of the free spectral range and resolution you're going to use. Uh, basically, a, a grading will only give you a factor of two of the wavelength of this free spectral range, unless you do something very clever to handle the uh, order separation issue. Uh, in the uh, sun photo spectrometer, we actually use an order filter and you can switch back and forth between uh, the UV and, and the visible near IR. And of course, wavelength assignment is always an issue. You need to do an initial wavelength assignment, and then you need to track whether there are small shifts and stretches in the spectrum uh, to make sure that you uh, accurately represent the performance of the instrument in terms of your model of the instrument in order to extract the information you're trying to measure. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about Brewer straight away. Actually, I'm going to talk a fair bit about Brewer because it's kind of an archetype of a lot of the measurement issues that we're dealing with. The Brewer, as I mentioned, has six slits that are accurately positioned mechanically in the, in the middle screen. And then we can adjust the, uh, the grading to make sure we get the wavelengths that we want to fall on the individual slits. The straight light issue really comes in because of ozone itself. Uh, Rayleigh's scattering, of course, is uh, one over lambda to the fourth, so it increases fairly rapidly in, uh, towards shorter wavelengths, but nothing like as fast as the, the ozone uh, absorption changes. Uh, the cross section itself changes roughly exponentially as a function of shorter wavelength, and of course, the intensity is again the exponential of that, so it changes extremely fast. And you can see the difference here just going from a little bit of ozone, that's 200,000 units up to one and a half centimeters that you might see at air mass three and 500,000 uh, units in the air of spring. And you see the light's gone down here by four orders of magnitude. And if you're trying to measure down here, that's probably five or six orders of magnitude in the case of the blue curve. Any little bit of light that comes from shorter, what are longer wavelengths rather, is going to contaminate the measurement you make at the short wavelengths. 
So as the short wave light goes away, you'll reach the floor and your absorption function is going to change anymore. That's the problem straight away when you can measure in this region. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the basic measurements uh, process in a, in a brewer, which is representative of any instrument that you're using on the ground, except that we're all using with a small number of wavelengths. The optical depth that we see is the sum of the optical depths from all of the different absorbers that are uh, simultaneously affecting the transmission of light through the atmosphere. So C is an index over the different absorbers, which would be something in the case of the brewer, like ozone, uh, radio scattering, uh, aerosol scattering, and, uh, and, and uh, salt dioxide absorption. Uh, so it's the product of the absorption coefficient, the amount of the absorber, and the enhanced path length due to the sun angle uh, in the atmosphere. This is the so-called air mass factor, which is very simple in the case of this uh, flat Earth model here. It's just the secant of the solar zenith angle uh, marking the uh, the enhancement of the path through a horizontal uh, slide of atmosphere. Of course, it's more complicated if you look at the spherical Earth and you look at large solar zenith angles. Uh, you can go to the uh, uh, an approximate uh, path through a curved atmosphere at altitude. You can go to the Chapman function, or you can go to an actual numerical model to actually get it right, including the vertical distribution of the, the gas through the entire atmosphere. Now, again, as I mentioned before, the, uh, the absorption cross-section for ozone changes pretty much exponentially as a function of wavelength. You see this is a, a larger than scale here. And so even over a very short wavelength range between the shorter and the longer wavelength that's used for measuring ozone, we have a tremendous change in the actual size of the cross-section. See, it's almost an order of magnitude over just that short wavelength range. So that presents two things, an advantage, which means we're very sensitive to the ozone if we look at the difference in the intensity of those two wavelengths. But it also means that you don't want any light coming in from somewhere else where the cross section is much smaller and the light signal is huge because it'll just swap the uh, true signal that you're trying to measure at the short wavelength. Now, how do we make a measurement of the ozone? Well, if we look at uh, a particular wavelength, and, and lambda s is the short wavelength that I showed on the previous slide at the higher uh, cross-section, uh, then the light is attenuated by the optical depth at that wavelength in passing through the atmosphere. And if we also make a measurement at a longer wavelength, we'll have a slightly bigger optical depth uh, at that wavelength. And in both cases, the optical depth is the absorption uh, uh, cross-section or absorption uh, or the, uh, uh, the, the absorption uh, function for uh, ozone at that particular wavelength times the amount of ozone times the, uh, the air mass. Uh, conventionally, we use M to be the air mass for air, which is determined mostly near the ground because the pressure increases uh, as we get down the ground, and uh, mu is used to represent the path length through the stratosphere where the ozone is. So if we take a ratio of the intensities at the two wavelengths and take a larger than the ratio, uh, then we result in an equation like this. And here we have a, a differential absorption uh, uh, function uh, times the amount of ozone times the air mass. And what this means is that we don't need to measure the absolute intensity. We only need to measure the relative intensity of the short and the long wavelength, because both in the case of the measurement we make with the instrument and the inferred measurement that we make when we go outside the atmosphere, the ratio is all that matters. So we don't have to be concerned with the absolute sensitivity of the instrument, just the relative sensitivity of the two different wavelengths. And of course, if the two wavelengths are close together, and you use the same detector for both wavelengths, then you're greatly eliminating any dependence on instrument behavior or the intensity of the sun or anything else. <clears throat> so if we uh, invent a thing called the absorption function and uh, find it as the log of the ratio of the two intensities, we can write that equation in fairly simple form. 
uh, the F that we would measure at any point in time down here on the ground, uh, the F that we would measure if there were no ozone in the atmosphere, which is often referred to as the extraterrestrial constant, and then attenuated by the uh, amount of uh, ozone absorption that goes on in the atmosphere, where the delta alpha is the uh, differential uh, absorption coefficient. And uh, the simple thing is air mass is one of the cosine, which I mentioned before, or the C kind of the solar zenith angle and uh, represents the uh, uh, air mass factor for a flat Earth approximation. Now, that's pretty good up to about 70 degrees solar zenith angle when you're making measurements from the ground. Now, one of the, one of the mysteries of life is, well, what's for me when I was a master student anyway, was how can you put, point this thing at the sun and figure out what it would measure if there was no ozone? We know how to calculate this thing. So we know the response of the function to ozone. If we change the amount of ozone, we know how the function is going to change. But how do we know what the absolute amount of ozone is? And uh, it's a, a kind of a thought experiment. If you go out on a day when ozone isn't changing, and you plot the value of that function as a function of the air mass, you expect to find a linear function if the ozone amount is constant. And if you extrapolate back to zero, that's essentially extrapolating back to no ozone in the atmosphere. And so you can infer what the instrument would measure if you were able to take all the ozone out of the atmosphere. Uh, conversely, you can also look at it a little differently, which is to say that the, the slope of that curve is related to the amount of ozone. The Brewer is kind of interesting because uh, the inclusion of the correction lens means that the uh, optical performance of it is actually very good. So the, the slip function can actually be approximated as a, uh, a trapezoid to pretty high accuracy. And uh, that means that we can do uh, simple tests in the laboratory uh, to determine the uh, slopes and, the, and, and the, the width of the flat at the top, and then go ahead and very accurately calculate the cross section that applies to each individual wavelength and thereby have an accurate estimate of the response of the instrument to ozone. Uh, this is a lot more complicated in the case of many of the smaller diode ray type instruments because the, uh, uh, this, the larger F number and the uh, smaller uh, dimension uh, makes it more difficult to control the uh, geometry. Now, to get right into the uh, spray light thing, uh, this is uh, uh, the Brewer uh, number seven is a single monochromator instrument. That means it has one refraction gradient, one entrance slit, one mirror, and exit slits, and then a photomultiplier detector. And so it is going to be more susceptible than uh, to stray light than if you had a double monochromator where you actually put the light backwards for the second instrument to reject stray light. And you can see that the gradients are really pretty good. The, uh, the, the wings out here are already down by five orders of magnitude compared to the, uh, the peak. But one of the problems, of course, is that there is this uh, area of sort of nearby straight light, which is quite important because the gradient of ozone absorption is so high. It's really in the local uh, straight light that's more important than the stuff that's coming from far away, unless you've got a really dirty gradient or something that happens. And nobody can ever one of the things that was interesting here was to, to decide whether we could actually define a single slip function that could be used for all of the Brewer slips. So we actually have two different wavelengths here, 325 and 352. Uh, they're both uh, uh, helium uh, cadmium lasers. And if you shift them so they're on top of each other, you can see that indeed the slip function is very, very well defined over the uh, 10 or 20 nanometer range of the, uh, the Brewer slips. And so we can actually uh, uh, predict the contribution of straight light. One of the thought experiments you need to do is that if you, if you do a scan across the laser like this, and then you're going to use that slip function to determine the straight light contribution, you actually have to reverse it. Because of the fact what we're doing here is finding out the source of light from here that shows up there. And what we really want at this wavelength is the opposite. And so if you're going to actually use that as a, a function to convolve to calculate straight light, you have to 
reverse it. But as you can see, in this particular case, it's really pretty symmetrical. So it's not really a big deal. Well, we started off with the brewer uh, when we began to do uh, long uh, scans from 290 to about 340 nanometers to measure uh, the uh, UV spectrum to calculate the UV index and other things. Uh, we found out that, in fact, there were a lot of counts coming in at 290 to 295 nanometers, which clearly were not real light at like those wavelengths. It was clearly light like coming from longer wavelengths. And so the zero order correction was just to add up uh, an average here of about five points, uh, which would include the dark count plus straight light, and then subtract it from all other wavelengths. The idea being that at this wavelength, it would be an exact subtraction. As you went to longer wavelengths, it would be a pretty good subtraction. And then finally, when the light got brighter, it wouldn't matter anymore. So it was kind of a good first approximation to doing straight light correction. But in the end, we found out really that it was the nearby straight light that was the problem. And clearly, that actually didn't represent the nearby straight light. Uh, the tally came up with a somewhat better correction, which was to actually use the uh, spectrum of uh, uh, straight light, the, the figure I just showed, the, uh, the laser scan, and using a theoretical uh, spectrum to, uh, cal to calculate a straight light value, and then scaling to match the value that came out of this calculation, and then subtracting that off. And that was a, an improved thing because it did handle the behavior of the nearby straight line. The way he did it originally was to, to build up a, a spectrum like this where he said, okay, we've got the central slip function which we can measure very well, and then he put a couple of straight lines in to represent the behavior of the wings of the, uh, of the straight line function. But I basically went on and used that for the uh, CPFM instrument by saying, well, if we really know the absolute intensity of that key, that these are all relative intensities, and if we define that curve uh, analytically here with a slope here, a breakpoint, and another slope, and so on, then we can go ahead and actually convolve that with uh, the straight light function, or with the intensity function that the instrument sees, and then subtract that away from the measurement and uh, get an, an, an accurate correction. What I started in the long run, though, was basically this, this is not necessarily really a straight line. It can actually be represented pretty well by Lorentzian. And in the case of the Brewer, where we're doing very careful measurements as a function of wavelength, um, you can uh, make this come up very well. So there's the Lorentzian equation. And you can actually fairly easily write a retrieval program uh, that allows you to retrieve the A and the B. And uh, in this case, we start off with the first guess and then run the retrieval and uh, fit a curve that matches it. Uh, we use the geometric slip function out to a certain point and then use the fitted uh, uh, wings of the uh, Lorentzian to represent the straight line behavior beyond that point. Uh, you can see because of the uh, fact that there is a finite core to the uh, geometric slip function, that the best performance is to have one Lorentzian that shifted at one way to fit the left side and shifted a little bit the other way to fit the right side. There's a, a very, oh, there we go, change computers and you get interesting things. That's what you <laughs> on. You never know what's going to happen. Uh, I used to have a lot of trouble because I prepared slides in, in uh, uh, Word Perfect and then when you move them onto another machine, uh, the uh, Microsoft operating system couldn't handle it at all. Anyway, so uh, the idea here is uh, a very simple uh, sort of turn of the century retrieval technique, which is to say, well, let's assume that the straight light function isn't that big, that the corrections are you know, fairly small. Well, we can make a first guess and say, well, maybe the function, the spectrum we actually measured is a reasonable approximation of the true spectrum. Convolve it with the uh, straight light function and generate a guess for the straight light spectrum. 
then subtract it off the measurement and evolve the game. And after a couple of iterations, it converges and gives you a very good correction to the straight line. So it's a fairly simple process. You can also go through and do it in a more formal way, doing a, an FFT and a deep and all that stuff. But this is a fairly straightforward kind of technique that actually provides a, a useful correction. I, I have a, an example here of uh, the uh, uh, sun photo spectrometer uh, data from the ER2 uh, taking uh, high altitude. Uh, the, uh, you can see the uh, use of a blended spectrum, which is the first order spectrum and then the second order spectrum. And uh, particularly in this region, of course, the straight line is more important. They didn't bother to plot it over here. It's, it's still a little more constant. And this looks like the spectrum itself. But here's the straight line spectrum that has been subtracted off the original measurement to produce the uh, example spectrum you see here. And you can see we are going down there. You know, quite a long way, a couple of orders of magnitude or more. In actual fact, it turns out that at 300 nanometers, about 60% of the signal was straight light. But having corrected for that, uh, we were actually able to do a plot of the dependency of the spectrum on the amount of ozone in the path as a function of solar angle and the amount of ozone that actually tracked the ozone cross section down to 302 nanometers. So the correction was actually extremely good, right down to about 302 or even a bit below, uh, which was important for us when we were doing this photolysis of, uh, of ozone. And the other thing you can do, of course, is uh, generate a, a noise estimate. This is the uncertainty calculated from the uh, statistics on the uh, spectrum here. And then when we blend it, there's a little bit of filtering to bring the resolution of the UV spectrum to match the, the visible one and then they're blended together. So the noise level in the blended spectrum looks a little smaller than the improved statistics that came out of the uh, uh, moving average on, on the spectrum. With Maestro, it was a little more complicated because we did have the, uh, the two order filters. Uh, we had a UV instrument and a visible instrument. Uh, I was really worried that the detector couldn't be trusted to have a really bright light on it and measure a really dim light somewhere else by just changing the integration time. So what we did was actually put a little, uh, we made one measurement, which is this one. It was done with uh, a very bright laser uh, uh, beam. Well, it attenuated so that it was within range of the detector. But, and then we put a little flag in the block about 50 pixels in the middle of the uh, grading and then crank the integration time way up so that we could actually measure out at the, uh, the lower levels. And you can see we were able to define a pretty good uh, definition for a straight light function uh, down here. You know, that's uh, one, two, three, four, five, almost six orders of magnitude uh, with a very simple concave holographic grading and a red con a diode ray detector. So then this was the definition of the uh, straight light function that we use in doing the correction for uh, the maestro data. Uh, this is just an example of uh, uh, a model uh, that you produce a Lorenzi and add random noise to it and see whether you can really uh, uh, retrieve the uh, characteristic uh, shape of the thing. Yeah, it's an interesting little retrieval exercise to do. I'll talk a bit later if I have enough time about how we can use simple retrieval techniques in order to uh, solve these nonlinear equations. I make my students do this. That's another, another example that's blown up to, to show the, uh, the fitting in, in close. The, uh, the purple line is the first guess, and then the, the program uh, uh, adjusts the two parameters of the uh, Lorenzi to, uh, to fit the observed data better in the presence of noise. Now, one of, one of the interesting things about the uh, the Redicon detector is the fact that uh, it was randomly addressable, which means you integrate up all the pixels together and then you read out one pixel at a time with the transmission gauge. So unlike CCDs, it means that the individual pixels are almost independent of the other pixels. So you might read one pixel and see a shadow of the previous pixel, but you're not going to see a shadow of pixels that are more than just a few away. And because the spectrum changes relatively slowly, as a function 
wavelength, it doesn't seem like a huge uh, problem. Uh, there is still a, a carryover problem with the other time because you have to reset the entire array and you don't have forever for the whole array to go to zero. And so there's a carryover which is proportional to the interval over the whole spectrum. And you have to apply a correction to that. But it's very straightforward because it's one number that corrects all of the pixels, which is quite a different picture than you would get in a, uh, a conventional true CCD detector where you're shifting everything out of the dark and then shifting it down there so that you're getting both uh, spectral and spatial smearing in the final output. Uh, more modern detectors are using uh, more readouts so that you don't have as much overlap as the original uh, CCD uh, thing. Clearly, though, there's one, one simple thing you can do is to make sure that you, you put the right one at the right end of the array so that you read out the newer ones first and they, they provide less of a correction needed to the next one that comes out the door. Random addressing, as I said, really uh, is helpful. There are detectors that are available, 2D detectors that do have uh, random addressing. And one of the things that's nice about them is under high light conditions, you can read them out continuously and then just take account of the time at which each pixel was measured and then these do the, the timing. And so each pixel, as I mentioned, is only contaminated by nearby pixels and they have similar signal levels, so you have a much smaller direction problem uh, than you do if you have high gradients across the system where it's smearing from one detector to another. So of course, you have to have strategies to try and understand these different effects that all go on at the same time. I say that the instrument designer's problem is to figure out a mental model of how the whole system works and then figure out different tests that will probe the different parameters in that model independently so that you can find a correction for each of the problems that are contributing to the final answer. So in general, this is the, the picture of trying to do a, a real measurement. Uh, you need to have an atmospheric transmission model, of course, that includes the properties of the atmosphere. But then you need to have an instrument model as well, because the, the proper way of analyzing data, if at all possible, is to actually compare uh, in measurement space, because you know exactly the um, a characterization of the noise level on true measurements. But if you start messing with the measurements and feeding it in at the intermediate <coughs> point here, it can be very difficult to know whether you properly transmit the information concerning uncertainty into the, uh, the process properly so that your final estimate of performance in your retrieved parameters makes sense. So you need to develop a model for the electronic offset. Uh, you need to model the dark count. Uh, and, and, and that may uh, be based on uh, keying to dark pixels. If you have the opportunity to have some pixels where you notice very little or no light, then you can use that essentially as a proxy measurement for the temperature of the array and then uh, use a, uh, some kind of a, a regression process to predict what the dark count on each pixel should be based on that indicator. Charge carryover is, is one of the problems that is very detective uh, dependent, so you have to have a strategy for understanding exactly what that is. It may involve uh, putting white light on in the laser as well, or covering up part of the array and seeing what light leaks out of the other parts. Uh, obviously, you need to correct the straight light somehow. You need to build that into your forward model or you need to do some kind of a correction. And you need to get all that into your forward model in some way uh, in order to uh, uh, be able to uh, have confidence in the retrieved parameters. And of course, the best thing is if you can come up with a strategy for being able to retrieve some of those parameters on orbit data so you're not totally dependent on having to assume the instrument hasn't changed as a result of a drive in space or its exposure to radiation or temperature by radiation and so on. So you need different types of measurements to get a key to those different uh, issues. Uh, one example is long duration times and testing in the area signal processing. Uh, I, as an example, I show laser measurements allow you to look for straight light as a function of wavelength. Um, the, uh, 
the block mine center measurement is, is useful to separate electronic offsets from uh, stray light. Um, glass filters are kind of interesting because uh, they kind of look like ozone, right? They put a, a cutoff at short wavelengths. Different kinds of glass fall off fairly rapidly at various wavelengths uh, uh, at short end. So uh, you can uh, use that as a, uh, an opportunity. It doesn't help you much to understand how to fix the problem, but at least it will quantify the problem for you. Okay. We're really enjoying it. I'm the slip function over a, in a, an observed spectrum and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, uh, the, the, the bottom line is that a straight light is a really practical issue. Uh, if you, uh, the, the, this was the wake up call. Uh, we all knew that there was straight light in there because we've been working with the brewer for a decade or more trying to measure UV spectra, but it was hard to communicate to the ozone measurement community, you know, the old boys, the Dawson guys, that straight light was undoubtedly a problem for both brewers and, and Dawson's. But this uh, little NASA campaign up in, uh, in uh, Fairbanks really showed us what was going on. Uh, the green dots here are a double brewer, number 85, and you can see the way out to these uh, fairly early uh, times in the day when the sun angles are quite large. The amount of ozone is huge. Uh, it's pretty flat. Uh, number seven is a single brewer and it's falling off. The Dodson AD is, is way down, you know, 15 Dodson units below. Uh, the CD measurements aren't so bad. The AD measurements include the room short wave and the CDs are using larger ones. But clearly, both the AD and the, and the CD need to be corrected in the Dodson even more than the brewer. So it's become a practical issue to try and understand this. Uh, OMID, my student, has done a physical model of the instruments, both the Dobson and the brewer, and been able to look at uh, the behaviors. Uh, the, uh, the worst one here is the AD, the red one, and the blue one is the double brewer. I've got very large ozone amounts. And uh, basically, uh, we understand why the instrument is doing what it's doing. And the reason for doing this is that I wanted to see whether we could just parameterize this fall off as a polynomial and then be able to correct the measurements instead of running go through a whole physical retrieval process. And as I said before, I probably won't be able to get through all the mathematics. So I'll just tell you it's here and you should probably have a look at it. There's some retrieval stuff in there. And uh, there's the form of the, uh, oops. That's the form of the uh, uh, correction. Where, oh, sorry. That's the form of the correction. We're basically sticking in a little correction based on the uh, eta power of the uh, absorption due to ozone. Uh, so that's the differential absorption cross section, the air mass, and the amount of ozone. And so we have this tiny correction um, based on a sum high power. Uh, one of the interesting things I was just going to say is that it's kind of fun. Uh, to look at the fact that uh, if you differentiate with respect to gamma and you differentiate with respect to eta, the two functions are parallel to each other. So you can't actually do a matrix retrieval because you've got two, two lines in the matrix that are proportional to each other and then determine zero and you can't do the solution. And so it's uh, kind of interesting to have another. Now, already on file here, I think, is uh, a whole lecture on this particular mathematics. So, uh, if you want a little more detail, you can go back into the files and take a look at that. But uh, this is an interesting exercise uh, to take a look at uh, to understand how to use uh, linear retrieval theory for uh, reasonably nonlinear problems in order to solve equations like the fairly complex one that showed you. So that's it.